Thank you. We are continuing our study of the book of Genesis, and in particular, the creation account in the first two chapters. The uh, creation account in the first two chapters is a creation account that is dear and precious to Christians. Unfortunately, has been rejected by much of the world. In chapter 1, uh, God tells us about the creation of the universe with just a brief mention of the creation of man. In chapter 2, God returns to his brief mention of man and focuses on the creation of man, the crown in his creation, and gives us a lot more details about the creation of man. The biblical creation is unique among the creation accounts because, first of all, it's true. That's my bias, but I make no apologies for it, and I know neither do you. In most pagan accounts, and it's unusual in this sense, in most pagan accounts, the universe is eternal, and the universe brings gods into existence. In the biblical account, God is eternal, and he brings the uh, creation into existence. Uh, there are a variety of views held by people in general about the creation of the universe and life. Atheistic evolution is one that's very popular in the Western world. And atheistic evolution rejects God playing a part in the origin of life. Again, so often you'll hear uh, evolutionists say, oh, no, we don't reject God. But in fact, they do reject God. And that's just a dis that's they're simply lying. The difficulty you have sometimes talking with non-Christians is you don't get an honest dialogue. And when they say we're not rejecting God, that's simply not true. Atheistic evolution it requires basically three elements. One is mutation, second natural selection, and the other is time. And when they say talk about mutation, they are by chance, not design, by chance. Darwin himself said so, and so do all the others. Biblical creationism as a different view of things. Biblical, the biblical creationist says that man is a created being. He is created, has been created by Jehovah, the God of scriptures. And man was created a perfect being. When God made us, there wasn't a single flaw. Perfection, however, was important because it was the basis of our relationship with God, which is why God, in order to continue having a relationship with human beings, had to atone for our sins and in so doing, enable us to be born again into a new kingdom where we will be perfect. When we walk the streets of heaven, we will be perfect, and we will be perfect in every way. Man was a created being, created by Jehovah, who's created perfect, and he was created in the image and likeness of God, and we're going to talk a bit about that later this evening. There are three very popular views held among Christians. Now, for those of you who've looked in your old systematic notes, I listed about a dozen, dozen different views. Uh, and if you get a book on creationism and that kind of thing, or a good commentary on Genesis, they'll undoubtedly give you a list of many others. But this is a survey course, so I don't want to get too bogged down in this creationism. I'm spending more time on Genesis chapters 1 and 2 than I'll probably spend on any other chapters, but the primary reason for that is this. If you don't get Genesis 1 and 2, you don't really get Judeo-Christian religion. You got to get these two chapters down. This is the foundation for the whole thing. I think one of the problems a lot of Christians have is they just don't get chapters 1 and 2. So we're spending a little bit more time, but I don't want to spend too much. So anyway, three popular views held about Christians. One is the literal six-day theory. This view is that God created the universe and everything in the universe in six 24-hour days, and on the seventh day, he rested. Day one, God said, let there be light, and there was light. Day two, God said, let there be sky, and there was sky. Day three, God said, the, the, the dry land appear, and it appeared, and so forth. That's a, the, probably the most popular view. There's the day-age theory. Many Christians hold to this, and I don't, I don't want you to think, you know, so, well, I ran into a, a pastor one day who believed that anyone who didn't believe in the, the, the six 24-hour day uh, story of creation was somehow a heretic, and that's simply not true. I think it's the best view. I think it's the one that is most supported by Scripture, but there are a lot of fine Christians who have a few other views. I don't by theistic evolution. Not just any old view will pass, but there are a variety of views that men and women who are genuinely born again and have a high view of Scripture hold. Sometimes you just have to recognize what we can be super dogmatic about and what we can't get super dogmatic about. You know, truth is important. Truth is not only knowing what you can believe, but truth is also knowing what you can't be quite too certain of. 
often when you come to a passage of Scripture, there might be a couple of interpretations that are good, and the wise man recognizes that. So, in any event, the most popular view is probably the six literal, uh, the literal six-day theory. I subscribe to that, so I'll tell you my bias on the front end. The day-age theory is that each of those days was a period in time, and you can build a case for that scripturally. And the third very popular view is the gap theory, this is held by Schofield and a lot of uh, folks, and you can build also a very good case for this. Um, and the gap theory is, is, says that there's a gap between verses 1 and 2. Let me read through that and just give you a sense of it again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then there was a gap. He created the heavens and the earth, and apparently something happened. Like Satan and the angels rebelled, they were cast to earth, and the punishment was that the earth became formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And then the Spirit of the God was hovering over the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. The idea here being that God created the heavens and the earth, and that's when the dinosaurs and those sort of creatures were around. Satan fell. The earth became formless and void. And then the creation account we read in the rest of Genesis chapter 1 was a recreation. And a lot of very godly people believe in this. All right. A, another view held by Christians is theistic evolution. We talked about this briefly. I'm not going to spend too much time. We talked about it a lot last week. I'm not going to spend too much time on it this evening. But it is an effort to harmonize evolution with a creator God. There are a lot of biblical problems with theistic evolution. By the way, there are a lot of scientific problems with evolution in general. Now, with theistic evolution, being with it, it is just absolutely contrary to scriptures. And I find it amazing this week that the Pope said that, that, that evolution is not contrary to scripture. Well, it is contrary to scripture. And then he made, and I don't want to get into the whole Catholic, Catholic bashing thing, but I, mean, I, would, I would have the same, I'd make these same statements if it was a Protestant who, who made a statement like this. Indeed, many Protestants do, sadly. So he's in good company there. But uh, he said this, uh, that evolution is not contrary to Scripture. Well, it is indeed contrary to Scripture, and I'll, I pointed out a lot of that last week, and I'll review it very quickly. And the other thing is, uh, God doesn't, uh, is, isn't, doesn't what's carry magic wand. Now, it's true, I wouldn't use the word magic to describe God's supernatural power. Magic is a word we usually reserve for Satan's supernatural power. And Satan does have supernatural power. So we use the word magic for that. So I would never use magic in describing God's supernatural power. But that wasn't the point he was trying to make. The point he's trying to make is God is, wouldn't just have the supernatural. He wouldn't speak the, the universe into existence. Are you kidding me? Of course God spoke the universe into existence. He's God. All I could think of was that's a very small view of God. God isn't magical. His idea was that we probably evolved. The scriptures, uh, don't, uh, the evolution is not contrary to scriptures, and God wouldn't just speak it into existence. God did speak it into existence. So theistic evolution is contrary to scripture, and we talked about a number of problems. If, in fact, we evolved, what do you do with the story of Eve and the rib? Would God spend millions and millions of years helping man evolve, and then after man has evolved, say, oh, I'm going to abandon evolution now and start special creation by taking a rib out of Adam and creating Eve. If Adam evolved, so did Eve. Then what do you do with the story of, of Eve and the rib? You rip that out of your Bible. And then there's the big issue is this, the cause-effect relationship between sin and death. Evolution requires essentially three things. Mutation, that is a genetic a change in a particular organism. And then if that genetic change makes that organism more capable than others in its species, it survives and the others die off. It's called survival of the fittest. If there's a mutation that enables one species to become more capable, it survives and the others die off. In short, there's got to be a lot of death. Natural selection is, de is, is survival for the fittest and death for everybody else. You understand? Mutation and death. Well, if, in fact, uh, theistic evolution is true, then God is the author of death because he brought us into existence through mutation and natural selection. Natural selection is survival of the fittest, which means the less fit don't survive. They what? They die. So if God brought us into existence, then he's the author of death. 
So what's the cause-effect relationship between sin and death? The Bible keeps telling us over and over and over. Death came about because of sin. The wages of sin is God is the author of life, Peter said. He is not the author of death. John wrote that life is natural to God, not death. So there are a lot of very heavy-duty problems with theistic evolution. Now, don't misunderstand. God can do whatever he wants to do. If God had chosen to, to create life through evolution, that's his affair. I wouldn't argue with him. I'm a little speck of dust, a corrupt speck of dust at that. So I wouldn't argue with God. My point is, that's not what he did based on the scripture. My only source of truth is the Bible. That is the great source of truth in this dark world of ours. And if you want truth about things, you better just stick with the word. And the truth of the matter is, evolution is contrary to Scripture. And uh, so, there are major problems with theistic evolution. Unfortunately, we have a lot of folks who are intimidated by the secular academic community. Shame on them. All right. <clears throat> In chapters 1 and 2, we're introduced to the creator and the creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the Bible assumes the existence of God. It doesn't give you a lot of arguments for it, though he tells us that if we looked at creation, we should know that he exists. In this statement, God refutes his many critics and the skeptics. He refutes the atheist who claims there is no God because in the first four words of the Bible, we read, in the beginning, God. He refutes the agnostic who says, we cannot know God. God says, I've just introduced myself. <laughs> he refutes the polytheist. Those who believe that there are many gods, no, there's one God. In the beginning, God, singular. He refutes the pantheist who says that all nature is God. No, in the beginning, God, and then God brought nature into existence. So he refutes that person. He refutes the materialist who said matter is eternal and not created. Nope, in the beginning, God, and then God brought into existence the universe. And he refutes the fatalist. Well, the rest of the Bible is about refuting the fatalist who says there's no purpose to life. The Bible assumes the existence of God in this statement in the first four words. God refutes his many critics and skeptics. And we're introduced in the first chapter of Genesis to God's personality. And I mention this because there are lots of folks who view God as a force. The Star Wars War Saga, the film series, the Star Wars, they talk about God, but just as the force force be with you. I find that disgusting. I enjoy the, mirror, the film, don't misunderstand. I even like bad films. I even like B films. But uh, it was, you know, and, and it was a takeoff on Christians. How many times there, there, there's a phrase that has passed among us, may the Lord be with you, may the Lord be with you. And Lucas picked up on that, and uh, may the force be with you. But the force in the Star Wars saga, was not a personal God. It was, it was just a power in the universe that sort of kept it all going. As one man said, it's kind of like a tr electricity. You can use the electricity to run an iron lung and keep somebody alive, or you can use it to run an electric chair and kill somebody. It's a force. And you see that in the Star Wars saga, don't you? Notice? Uh, Luke Skywalker uses the force for good, and Darth Vader uses the force for evil. Now, this is a significant cultural phenomenon, because really what they're doing is they're priming people for the idea that there is a great force in the universe, and that force is important. It's just a force. You get it for good or evil. Well, God denounces that on the front end in the book of, Revel uh, in the book of Genesis. It's like God knew that, that there would be the Star Wars saga, and these people would get this loony idea about an indifferent, impersonal force in the universe. So in the very first chapter, we hear God speaking, seeing, naming, and blessing. Impersonal forces don't do that. He speaks, God said, let there be light. He sees, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. God names, he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And God blesses, God created man and woman, and God blessed them. So it's almost like in chapter 1 of Genesis, God saw Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader coming down the pike, and he says, let's just nip that in the bud right now. I'm not an impersonal force. I see, I talk, I name, and I bless, and that ain't impersonal. Continuing, 
We're introduced to God in chapter 1. The Bible assumes of his existence. The Bible, uh, in this statement, God refutes his many critics. We're introduced to his personality, and we're introduced to his great character, his wisdom, his glory, his power, his divine nature, and the insignificance of man. In chapter, no one can look at creation and not be amazed with how brilliant God is. Now, we don't use the word brilliant but, uh, too often, but he is incredibly brilliant. He is smart. All right. We're introduced to the Creator in chapter 1. We're also introduced to His creation. This is where we ended last week. The creation of the universe was a wondrous event. And I love this passage in Job chapter 38. This is toward the end of the book of Job. Job is a remarkable man, but like all of us, he was grumbling a bit. Well, I can appreciate that. I mean, he lost his family, he lost his wealth, he lost his health, and his wife was nagging him. All bad. And his friends weren't very comforting. And so he was grumbling because he said, his friends kept saying, you must have committed some terrible sin. He's saying, I don't know what terrible sin it was. And of course, he was right and they were wrong. But he was grumbling and he was saying, God, really, you should have treated me better. And God comes down and says, okay, now you shut up for a while and listen to me. And he begins with this, where were you? When I laid the earth's foundation, tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know who stretched a measuring line across it on what were its footing set and who laid its cornerstone. While the morning stars, that's another expression for angels. While the morning stars, that is the angels, sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. What God is saying, created the universe and it may have been a big bang. It may not. I don't know. If it was a big bang, we can be sure God lit the fuse. But where were you when I created the universe and the angels saw it and they were dumbfounded. They were shouting for joy. This was incredible. They were excited. You're not excited, but they were excited. <laughs> now you're excited. Okay. It's all, now you're a little excited. But they were excited. It was a stupendous event. It's okay to be excited. We have an exciting God. And he's created an exciting universe and it's going to be really exciting down the pike. So where were you when I created the universe? Job very wisely just shut up. <laughs> he just said, I'm not going to say a word. I like that man. All right, that's what we ended last week. Uh, we were introduced, as I pointed out, to the creator in chapter 1. We we're introduced to his creation. We're going to talk about the order of events in which God created uh, the universe and everything in it. And uh, that's really what chapter 1 is all about. God began the creation of the universe by creating a formless mass. In Genesis 1 and 2 we read this, In the beginning God created the heavens of the universe. Now the earth was formless and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the mass. The basic idea here is this. There was, there was this formless mass. It's almost as though God said, before I create the universe, I'm going to create matter. In this particular case, think of it like this. Think of a sculptor or potter grabbing a lump of clay, putting it on his shaping board, and then molding it and shaping it. That's the sense that you have here. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. It's sort of like he created matter. He's a potter getting ready to shape the universe, and he begins by taking a big lump of clay, and then he's going to mold it and to shape it into what he wants. And that's sort of the first step, was just creating this great molding, molded mass. And then he started shaping it into what he wanted. And these are the seven days. On day one, God created light. Now, immediately, the skeptics like to jump in and say, aha, uh -huh, that's a flaw, because in day four, it wasn't until day four that he created the sun and the moon and the stars. So, clearly it's wrong. Well, no, clearly they are wrong. Light is a very basic form of energy. It doesn't need a light source. It's a basic form of energy. In fact, the whole point in a nuclear explosion is turning mass into light. I mean, that's what happens in a nuclear explosion. You get enough uh, of fissional materials together, the whole thing explodes, and a portion of the mass turns into light energy. Light is a very basic form of energy, and that's what God created first. Now, later on on day four, he's going to create the sun and the stars that will be a continuing source to generate light, but he don't have to begin with that. 
He began by creating the very basic form of energy, which is light. Day one, let there be light. Day two, God set, let, created the atmosphere. And what we read, we read about that, I'm on page 119, in verses 6 through 8, God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated water under the expanse from the water above it. And it was so. God called the expanse sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Now, what are we getting at here? Apparently, the creation prior to the flood looked a little different than the creation after the flood. What happened, there was a lot of water, and God separated the two. There was the water we see in oceans and lakes and rivers. And then there was apparently a water vapor canopy somewhere above the earth that surrounded it. And we'll talk more about that when we get to a discussion of vegetation and even more when we get to the flood. But what this water canopy did was it made the world like a giant greenhouse. So much of a giant greenhouse that it was lush and very productive, which is why Adam and Eve were probably vegetarians. It wasn't until after the flood when God got rid of that water canopy that God told mankind they could eat meat. Now, if you very, read through the Scriptures very carefully, prior to the flood, vegetarians. After the flood, we continued eating fruits and vegetables, but God also added meat to our diet. Why was that? When there was this great water vapor canopy, the earth was a giant greenhouse, and it was a much more lush and much more uh, productive planet. Greenhouses are like that, you know, because it's, it's, it, they're producing fruits and vegetables year-round. So man didn't need meat to eat. But when the canopy was taken away as part of the whole flood process, we didn't have this greenhouse effect anymore, and the earth wasn't lush enough and productive enough for mankind to live on vegetables and fruits. So God said, I'll make an addition to your diet, and that's where when he allowed us to start eating meat. Now, I, maybe, maybe they disobeyed him early on and ate meat, but at that point, he says you can eat meat. So what we have on day one, God created light, a very basic form of energy. Day two, he created the atmosphere. What he says is he, the sky, he separated the waters from the waters on the earth to waters above the earth, and there was probably a great canopy, water vapor canopy, and I mean, that may be returning to us in the millennium, I don't know, but that must have been... That was probably the age of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs existed. They call them prehistoric, but I would view them, they, they, they are historic because they're almost certainly in existence at the time of Job. Job talked about dinosaur-like creatures, and we get to the, discussing the era before the flood. We'll talk about that more at length. But when they talk about dinosaurs and that whole era when dinosaurs existed, most uh, the paleontologists talk about it in terms of the earth being much lusher than it is today, enabling the dinosaurs to survive. Well, that's the way the world was prior to the flood. Why? Because that great water canopy, and then the second day is when God created the water canopy, the waters below from the waters above. You with me? Okay, day three. God created dry land and plants. On day four, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars. On day five, God created fish and birds. On day six, God created land animals and man. On the seventh day, God rested. He didn't rest because he was tired. God doesn't get tired. The word rested is a translation of the Hebrew word Shabbat or Sabbath, which means to desist or cease. God simply ceased working. He didn't get tired. Believe me, it's wonderful that God doesn't. If he did, we'd be in trouble because we need his help all the time. Okay, so you, this is the sequence. Day one, light. Day two, atmosphere with a canopy above. Day three, dry land and plants. Day four, God created the sun, moon, and stars. Day five, the fish and birds. On day six, land animals and man. Day seven, he rested or he ceased, or ceased creating. Now, I'm going to read a passage of just a few words, excuse me, from a variety of men 
I sort of talked about this great phenomenon of the creation. And uh, I don't normally read things like this, but uh, it's in your notes. It is worth reading because I want us to think about what we've just talked about, the creation of the universe. It was spectacular and it was wonderful. Genesis chapter 1 is a magnificent document that introduces us to God and his creation. It is a document that tells us in no uncertain terms that the God of Scripture created the universe and everything in it. And because he created the universe and everything in it, he is its sovereign ruler, its master, its Lord, its judge, and its king. Stop. You know why a world, we have a world filled with people who don't like the creation account in the first two chapters of Genesis? This is why. Because if God really did all he said he did, that means they're answerable to him. That means he calls the shots. If there is a God who created the universe and everything in it, including us, they all recognize that we're answerable to him. They don't want to be answerable to him. You know why? Because they don't like him. Why don't they like him? Because they don't like his rules and regulations. They don't like his standards of righteousness. They don't like what God really has to say in the Bible. So they don't want to answer to him. So if they can come up with another explanation for the existence of the universe, they, they foolishly think they won't have to answer them, but they're going to be in for surprise. In light of all this, the only reasonable course of action that we, his creatures, can take is that we acknowledge his authority, trust his wisdom, believe his word, obey his commandments, receive his grace, accept his salvation, and praise his name. Do you agree? Continuing. The odd thing is that throughout history, most of the men and women who have passed through this planet have rebelled against his authority. That's a totally true statement. They have refused his gracious offer of salvation, and they have even denied his existence. When men deny God's existence, they are forced to come up with other explanations for their own existence and the existence of the universe. So they create their own gods. Sometimes the gods they create are made of wood or stone. Sometimes the gods they create are invisible. Sometimes the god they create is the universe itself, the universe from which they believe they evolved. And that's a form of worship. When you believe in evolution, that's a form of worship. You're looking to the universe as your mother. In fact, they often call Earth mother. Listen to environmentalists today. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I, I missed a portion. I'm going to uh, read it from the, somehow it didn't get in. This is what happens when you get an old man as a teacher here. Okay, so uh, they believe they evolved. Now, on page 121, what should have preceded that was this. Carl Sagan, the late high priest of evolution, was a man who led worship services in adoration of the universe. Those of you who watch the Cosmos series on uh, public television know what I'm talking about. He was a scientist who led a series called Cosmos. And he did so through a series called Cosmos on public television. Sagan said this about the universe in one of his worship services. Now, he wouldn't like me calling it a worship service, but it was a worship service. Listen to what he said and see if this doesn't sound like a worship service to you. The cosmos is all that is or ever was or ever will be. It is the universe that made us. We are creatures of the universe. Obligation is to survive and flourish. Our obligation to survive and flourish is owed not just to ourselves, but also to the cosmos, ancient and vast, from which we spring. We are born to delight in the world. Suppression of ideas may come in religion, but not so in science. Well, that's a lie. You try to be a creationist in the biology department of any major university, I promise you, you will be suppressed. You will be kicked out. But notice that language. His language is not the language of science. It's the language of religion. We owe our existence to the cosmos, vast and great. No, we owe our existence to God. Continuing on, I think. Yes, here we are. 1,600 years ago, St. Augustine spoke about men like Sagan when he wrote, Thus does the world, the world forget you, talking about the, the creator, its creator, and falls in love with what you have created instead of you. Isn't that what Sagan just did? He, forget, he ignores the creator and falls in love with the creation. Whereas, in fact, the creation 
is so, spe- and it is spectacular. Sagan was right, the creation is spectacular. But that spectacular creation should lead us to an even more spectacular creator. If you see the Mona Lisa at the Louvre in Paris, what are you going to fall in love with? Who are you going to be awed by? Leonardo da Vinci who painted the thing? Or, or, the, or the work of art itself? Now, the work of art is beautiful, but what's really awesome is the one who was able to create that beautiful work of art. And what the creation, as magnificent as it is, should do is lead us to the magnificence of a creator. In every age, men and women have refused to believe in God, who really, the, the God who really created the heavens and the earth. And God calls these men and women fools. The fool, Psalm 14:1 says, the fool says in his heart there is no God. To believe that random particles could have evolved into complex, reasoning human beings is not unlike believing that a magic wand can change a frog into a princess. Warren Wisby wrote, Creation reveals the existence of God, the power of God, and the sheer brilliance of God. That this complex universe should appear by accident is as probable as the works of Shakespeare resulting from an explosion in a printing plant. Only a God of power could create something out of nothing, and only a God of wisdom could make it function as it does. The scientist who examines God's universe is only thinking God's thoughts after him. The laws he discovers are the laws that God built into his universe at the time he created it. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and those heavens and that earth declare his glory, and they tell me that he is glorious. And indeed, he is glorious. So I I'd urge you to read through that on your own and give some thought. We have a magnificent God, and this magnificent creation teaches us how even more magnificent he is. And we've only begun to explore how great he is. Now, Let's look at the creation of man. In chapters 1 and 2, chapter 1 tells us about the creation of the universe. Brief mention of man. In chapter 2, God returns, just picks up one of those, six day, this one of those events that took place on the sixth day, the creation of man, and gives us a lot more details. So what really you have to do, if you want to understand about the creation of man, you put together chapters 1 and 2. And if you combine the events, and what I'm going to do is sort of put them all together, because it mentions a little bit about woman in chapter 1, a little bit about woman in chapter 2. I'm just sort of going to put them together, and this is what you get. God created man in his own image and likeness. God formed man from the dust of the earth. God created man to rule the earth. Man was God's regent. Now, a regent is one who rules in the place of the real ruler. So God gave us this earth to rule as regents. He's the real ruler, but he's given us the authority to rule in his place. And indeed, in many ways we do. God created man, male and female, to be complementary and fruitful. God gave man the plants of the earth to eat. We talked about that a moment ago because there was this great water vapor canopy, day two, and it created a greenhouse effect. It was a greenhouse. You had lush growth year-round, and so men really didn't need mead to eat, and God gave uh, Adam and Eve uh, plants and animals to eat. No mention of, of animals, pl- excuse me, just plants to eat. No mention of meat. God gave man the plants to eat. God placed man in the Garden of Eden. God gave man work to do, tending the garden and naming the animals. This is important. We were assigned tasks. God wants us to work. Now, prior to the fall, the work was not painful and unpleasant. It was good, but we will always be working. And, uh, but the work will be a joy. At times, work is a joy. <laughs> Sometimes it isn't so joyful. But God gave them work to do. And finally, number eight, God prohibited man from eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's sort of a summary of the eight points we're going to go through as we look at this creation of man. All right. God created man in his own image and likeness. Let's begin there. Genesis 1, verses 26 through 31. And God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created him. Now, what's interesting is that when it came time to create man, God seems to have had a divine con- 
uh, conference. When God said, let there be light, all we read is God said, let there be light, and there was light. And then God said, let there be sky, and there was sky. And God said, let there be plants, and there was plants. And God said, uh, let there be animals, and there was animals. But when it came time to man, God let's us create man. It's like the members of the Trinity had a little conference. Notice none of that for the other creative events. And, and God said, let there be light. There was light. God said, let there be an expanse between the waters. And there was. God said, let the waters be gathered to one place. When it came to creating man, God said, let us make man in our own image. There was a bit of a, it's like they discussed it first. Because we are the crown in his creation. This was not a physical image, but a spiritual image. Let us make man in our own image and our own likeness. This isn't physical it's spiritual because Jesus said very clearly on page 124 in John 4, 24, Jesus said, God is spirit. In, in, John, in Luke 24, 39, Jesus said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So when God made us in his own image, he wasn't talking about a physical image. He was talking about a spiritual image. Now, most of you are looking at me and saying, I know that, David. Why are you talking about it? Well, the problem is some men don't seem to grasp that. Have you anywhere heard of Kenneth Copeland? Big TV guy. It's like he missed this. I'm going to quote Copeland, his quote. God is a being that stands somewhere around six foot two or six foot three. He weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple hundred pounds and has a hand span of nine inches. And I'm not kidding. Now, I don't know about that. At one time, I could tell you how he came up with a nine-inch hand span for God. But I, you know, it's been a while. I'll have to go back and research that to figure out how he came. But understand this. I mean, this is insane. Unfortunately, there's stuff like this going on all the time in the church. And I don't know where people get it, but he dreamed it up. So keep this in mind, just in case there is a Kenneth Copeland fan out there somewhere in TV land. Uh, God made us in his own image, and that image was not physical because God is not physical. It's a spiritual image. So what does that mean? That means that we differ from all other forms of life because we were created in God's image. God didn't create anything else in his own image. There was a wonderful quote from, from Hodge, Charles Hodge, great a 19th century theologian. Hodge wrote, in making man after his own image, God endowed him with those attributes which belong to his own nature as a spirit. Man is thereby distinguished from all other inhabitants of this world and raised immeasurably above them. He belongs to the same order of being as God himself. That's important. When he made us in his own image, he made us like himself. That's wonderful, and is therefore capable of communion with his maker. This conformity of nature between man and God is also the necessary condition for our capacity to know God, and therefore the foundation of our religious nature. If we were not like God, we could not know him. We would be like beasts in the field that perish. When we talk about being made and the image and likeness of God, it's a really big deal because that distinguishes us from all the other animals. Now, physically, we're much like other animals. For those of you who've, who've taken courses in gross anatomy in college, you probably, most colleges and undergraduate level can't use human cadavers. They use animals, other animals as cadavers. And many animals, I remember I took a course in gross anatomy in undergraduate school, and we used a pig. There's a strong similarity. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, the, the irony of it just knocked me out as an underclassman. But we're very much like pigs, anatomically and morally, I might add. But, uh, but, but you can have much the same skeletal structure, much the same endocrine structure, much of the same nervous structure. It's very, very similar. But aside from the jokes, <laughs> which is still fun, uh, we, unlike the pig, were made in the image of God. So anatomically, physiologically, we're in many ways like the other animals out there. But God made us in his own image. And that's what he's trying, God was trying to get at. We, if we were not made in his image, we'd like to be like the beast in the field. We belong to the same order of being as God. So 
God made us in his own image. The members of the Trinity had a divine conference. This was not a physical image, but a spiritual image. Man is different from all other forms of life. We are not like them. We are different from them. Now, if we evolved, it just one went one way, one went another. And unfortunately, in a world filled with evolutionists who don't recognize that we were very specially created in the image of God, they treat us just like the other animals. Let me read a few quotes from some radical environmentalists. But these folks are growing. And they reject this idea that there is a God who created us. They bind evolution. And because they fail to recognize that we were created and created in the image of God, they don't see us as being special. God sees us, however, as being special. This is what they're saying. Earth First is a very radical environmental group. And the fellow named John Davis who's part of that group, wrote this, human beings as a species have no more value than slugs. He also said, I suspect that eradicating smallpox was wrong. It played an important part in balancing the ecosystems. Uh, Dave Foreman, another man who is part of the Earth First group, wrote, phasing out the human race will solve every problem on Earth, social and environmental. And then there's the Wildlands Project. Oh, you could go on. There are hundreds of these. The collective needs of non-human species must take precedence over the needs and desires of human beings. Now, what's the flaw in their thinking? We were, they don't see people as being created in the image of God. That's enormous. The most horrifying quote from one of the radical environmentalists is one I read Oh, 15 or 20 years ago, one of the radical environmentalists was talking about how we're all fundamentally saved. The real problem of the planet is the human species, and we know how we need to eradicate a bunch of us. And he said, just to illustrate his point of how we're all basically equal, no human beings being created in the image of God would make him special. He said, if he was in a boat in the middle of the ocean, and his boat was broken, and uh, there was very little food and water left, and he was there with his son and his dog, he would have to strive, and there was only enough food and water for two to survive. He, and this is the truth, he would have a hard time deciding which to throw overboard, his son or his dog. And I'm not exaggerating one ounce on this. What's their great failure? They fail to recognize that we're created in the image of God. Now, if we weren't created in the image of God, a dog, a human being, whatever. But we were created in the image of God. So you can't slide through this thing. The reason I'm emphasizing this is so often we just read through Genesis and say, well, we're created in the image and the likeness of God, and we move on. You need to stop on that and think for a moment. That makes us special. This is why we are different from all the environmentalists. This is why we're different, because we were created in the image and likeness of God. God created man in his own image and likeness. The members of the Trinity seem to have had a divine conference when it came to doing that. Uh, this was not a physical image or a spiritual, it was not a physical image, but a spiritual image. Man is different from all other forms of life because we're created in God's image. This enables us to have an intimate and loving relationship with God because we're made in his image. Now, God created you and me to walk with him in the cool of the day. I know that there are churches out there that think that God created us to uh, keep the Ten Commandments. It's almost like God was up, and I'm not anti-Ten Commandments. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm trying to put you, give you a perspective here. I sometimes listen to some Christians. And it's almost like God was, before the creation of the heavens and the earth, God said, let's create a universe, and on that universe we're going to create a planet and put a bunch of people down there, and, 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 and the whole purpose of being there is to obey the rules. That wasn't the purpose. The purpose was to walk with God in the cool of the day. You were created to be God's companion. You were created to be someone he could love and who would love him, and you could walk together in the cool of the day. That's why you were created. This is wonderful stuff. But in order to be able to be a companion of God, we have to be like him. That's the reason he made us, unlike all the other animals, in his own image and his own likeness, because he wanted us to be like himself. The same order of being as himself is what Sahad said. Now, we're not omniscient the way God is omniscient. We're not omnipotent the way God is omnipotent. 
uh, and there are a lot of ways in which we're not like God, but we're like God in a variety of ways. Otherwise, you couldn't have a relationship with God. For example, how much of a relationship can you have with a goldfish? I know there's a film called Wanda, and some guy had a crazy thing about a fish. But aside from that whacked out movie, uh, the truth is, it's very hard to snuggle up with a goldfish and watch a movie in the evening, isn't it? Can't do it. Doesn't work well. Why? Because there's just too big a difference between you and goldfish. Too big a difference. On the other hand, about a dog. Well, now a dog, is, you can have a better relationship with a dog. And you can't go with this. You know why? Because it's a mammal, it's more like you. See, the more it's like you, the more intimate and loving the relationship can be. So I can't snuggle up with a goldfish, but I can snuggle up with a dog. And the dog likes me, and I like the dog. Well, if it's a Welch Corgi, I like it, otherwise, I don't like it. <laughs> There's only one dog for me. I'm loyal. I'm loyal. And if you ever had a Welch Corgi, you'd know what I was talking about. So, but you can have more of a relationship. But why is that? Why can I have a better relationship with a dog than I can a goldfish? Because the dog is more like me. But as good as that relationship is with the dog, it isn't like the relationship I have with my wife or another human being. Why? Because I like the dog, but I like my wife a lot better. <laughs> I better say that. <laughs> no, it's true. You do. You do. Why? Because she's more like me. And we get to the creation of woman. We're going to talk about the complementary aspects of this. But the more another creature is like you, the more intimate the relationship can be, even among human beings. It's very hard to have a relationship with a three-year-old who speaks Spanish as opposed to an adult who speaks English. You see what see we're trying to get at here? So what was the point in God making us like himself? He made us like himself because he wanted to have a loving relationship with us. That's why we're here, guys. And that's what we lost in the Garden of Eden. And that's what, uh, this is what this whole Christianity is all about. God says, you lost it, but one day I want to establish, reestablish it. And, and what value does the, the commandments and all the rules and regulations have? Because they give us the guidelines on how we can have a relationship with God. The rules and regulations are good, not as an end in themselves, but to monitor our relationship with God so we can know how we're supposed to walk with him in the cool of the day. You have to have a moral relationship. So, God created us in his own image because by making us in his own image, we can have a, a more loving and intimate relationship with him. Now, how are we like God? And I'm just going to talk about this briefly, and we'll shut down for the evening. We're like God, first of all, intellectually. If you create a being and it can't think, not much of a relationship. <laughs> I don't know about your relationship with your husband or your wife. And I'm picking on my wife now, but this is, I need illustrations. I enjoy when my wife comes home in the evening. She's been out doing something, and we sit down and talk. We have an intellectual and spiritual relationship. If she couldn't think or I couldn't think, we wouldn't have that. So God, in order to make us like himself, made us like himself intellectually. And there are a lot of folks out there and say, well, God is so intellectually beyond us, we, we're not on the intellectual same page. That's not so. God is intellectually beyond us, but he created us to think the way he thinks so we can communicate. If we didn't think the way God thinks, we couldn't communicate. But you need more than intellect to have a relationship. You've got to have emotion. Now, my computer does some amazing jobs, but, you know, I can drop dead tomorrow. My computer, computer wouldn't care. <laughs> wouldn't care. In fact, it'd probably be happy because you'd get a break. No emotion. So, you know, it's one thing to have a, a creature intellectual, but you've got to have some emotion. And so God made us like himself emotionally. So be sure of this. When God talks about love in the Bible, you do know what he's talking about. Don't listen to all that nonsense. No one knows what love is. Of course we know what love is. You know, I keep hearing that. Well, no one can define love. And they go off in this whole silly little argument. You, you've had a, you, most of you have kids. You love them. You know what love is. You have mom and dad. You love them, right? You have a wife. Have a husband, you love them. We do know what love is. So when God talks about love, we do know what he's talking about. When God talks about hate, we know what he's talking about. When God talks about joy, we all know what it is to 
experience joy. We know what he's talking about. When, we know, when God talks about anger, we know what he's talking about. So God not only gave us minds, intellects that are like his own so that we think similarly. To be sure, he will always be more brilliant than we, but we think similarly so we can communicate. In addition to that, he gave us emotions. We feel similarly. So when God talks about loving me and me loving him, I know what he's talking about. Don't listen to people who say, we're so beyond us that you can't know that. That's not so. The whole point in making us like himself was so we would have emotions similar to his. And thirdly, he gave us volition. Now, God could teach us to think and feel, but he didn't want a robot saying, I love you, I love you, I love you. Why would you want that? I mean, every so often they make movies about guys creating the perfect wives. But the little automatons that say, I love you, I love you. No. If, 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 if someone gave me a wife and she's paid to say she loved me, how much joy would I get out of that? You wouldn't get any love of that. My wife loves me. I'm delighted that she loves me. I don't understand why she loves me, but she loves me. It's voluntary. I, she wasn't made to do it. And she didn't need a nickel for it. It actually cost her. It's cost her. But I'm delighted that she wants to love me. And I think she's even glad that I love her. But you see, that's where volition comes in. God could have just created, stamped us a bunch of us out saying you can think and you, and, 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 and you can feel. And you know what? I'm going to program you to love me. God did not do that. He wanted us to want him. That's the reason there's so many commands in the Bible about loving God. And the reason for all those other rules and regulations is because if I love him, Jesus said, you will obey me. So I do love you, Lord, but I don't know how to express it. So God says, well, here's a bunch of rules and regulations that should govern your behavior with me. So you know what? I do love the Lord. And I look at the rules and regulations, not as an end of themselves, but as the guidelines how, on how I can express my love for the Lord and monitor our relationship. How we like God, we think the way he thinks. How we like God, we feel the way he feels. We can love and hate, and we get angry, and we get frustrated because those are emotions that are common to God. And we have volition. And the reason we made a mess out of this world is because we volitionally chose to rebel against God and corrupt it. The world's a mess not because of God, but because of us. And they often say, oh, I can't believe that a loving God would allow so much pain and suffering to go in the world. Don't blame God. Blame us and volition. But volition is critical. If we don't have volition, we're robots. And God did not want a bunch of robots who are programmed to bow before him. God wanted us to want him. And you know what? He gave us a Bible filled with information that will help us learn about who he is. And from that, we learn to love him. You love him. You've never met him. But you know, many of you have been studying the Bible for years. And out of the Bible, you feel like you know God. Don't you feel like you know him? And you've grown to love him. But that's something you've exercised on your own. That's what God wants. He wants us to be able to think. He wants us to feel. And he wants us to want him. He's not going to program us to. So he made it, gave us volition. And God also made us social beings. God is a social being. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit had a magnificent relationship with each other, and they still do. And get away from that nonsense of people. God created human beings because God was lonely. I've heard, I don't know, some people just make up dribble from the pulpit. I, uh, they're honest differences, folks, but some of the differences ain't honest. God is totally perfect and complete in and of himself. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit love each other. You read through the Gospels, and Jesus talking about the love of the Father and the love of the Son. You can see that they had that great loving relationship, and they were social beings. They enjoyed each other's company. And you know what they've done? They've made us to join with them. That's incredible. You have this great trinity that, has a, that, that loves each other and enjoys each other's company, and they're inviting us in. Isn't that neat? They're inviting us into that company of beings. Now, if we weren't social beings, it wouldn't have done any good to make us to be able to think like God and feel like God and have volition. If we weren't social beings, we wouldn't want to be with God. But notice how all this I'm talking, stuff I'm talking about is directed toward whom? Directed toward God. 
He created us because he wants to invite us to come and join the Trinity and enjoy their company, and they're going to enjoy ours. So God made us like himself intellectually, emotionally, volitionally, socially, and morally. And we'll close on this one. He made us like himself morally. Without a moral framework, two people cannot have a relationship. You can't have a relationship with somebody without some moral boundaries. You can't have a relationship with your neighbor if he steals from you. Can you? You can't have a moral, you can't have a social relationship with your neighbor if occasionally he comes over and kills your dog. You can't have a relationship, we laugh about it, but you, there's a moral framework in all relationships. There has to be, or you can't have a relationship with anybody. There are moral boundaries, whether we, out, we don't usually outline them, but they're there. And so there has, there's a more, God made us like himself morally. The book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes says that God made us upright, made us morally perfect. So guess what he's done? He wanted, he's, he wanted to make us creatures like himself. He could walk within the cool of the day and walk throughout eternity with. And he made us like himself intellectually, emotionally, volitionally, socially, and morally. And we botched it. And we'll talk about more of that next week, Okay. <laughs> when we talk about the next bunch of things that wakes us like God. Now, I know I'm spending more time on this than most surveys would demand, but my experience has been if you get Genesis 1, 2, and 3 down, it'll help explain the rest of the Bible. And if you don't get this stuff down, it's really hard to figure out. Okay? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We worship you. We thank you for being God and love us. Thank you for making us in your own image. <laughs> That's wonderful. To know that we are like you, the same order of being as you, and that you're inviting us into your special community is the greatest thrill this world has to offer. And I pray, Lord, that we'll live in the light of that every minute of every day and enjoy it to its fullest. Give us a good week, I pray. Bring us back next week to learn more about you. In Jesus' name we pray.